Well, welcome everybody to Rocky Mountain Audio Fest. Um, my name is John Atkinson. I'm the editor of Stereophile magazine. Um, been doing that for 32 years. Before that, I was the editor of Hi-Fi News magazine in the UK. Did that for four years. Before that, I did six years as an editorial assistant to Hi-Fi News. Before that, I was a musician for many years. Before that, I worked in scientific research. So I, I was thinking about the fact that this year is the 50, it's 50 years since I bought my first system. So I thought I'd just go through my audio system history. That was me, <laughs> age 12. You'll know from the ears that I was born to this life. Um, so, music, by the time I was 12, I was singing in choirs at school and I started to play the violin. Um, our school basically pushed music at everybody and violin was the instrument that was pushed at me. By 64, I was 16, it's me on the far right. I would picked up the bass guitar. I bought a guitar when the Beatles came out, because everybody did. But I quickly found the bass guitar was my instrument. That's the one where I felt most at home with. So did our first gig, June 64. We played Shadows, covers of Shadows instrumentals, Beatles songs that were instrumentals. None of us sung at that time. And this was at school. Now, I told you my school pushed music at us. They had mandatory music appreciation classes. And we had a teacher, he had a leak sandwich loudspeaker, a leak point one amplifier, and he'd play records for us for an hour. We, learned, we listened to Holst, Mars Suite, Sibelius, Finlandia, Tchaikovsky Fourth Symphony. And I didn't realize at the time how special that was. That that's something that schools don't do anymore. They do not expose their students to music. And it ignited a passion in me. The passion was dormant, well, not dormant, it was there lurking because I was playing the violin in all school orchestras, eventually my county youth orchestra. I played the bass guitar in bands. And, but it was this explosion of passion for music. So, in 68, I was at university, and in the UK at that time, Tuition was free, and you got a grant to pay for books and incidental expenses. So I, with my grant, I bought my first system. <laughs> so I had Wharfdale Super Linton speakers. It's a two-way bookshelf with the purple octopus plastic dome tweeter. Um, a Kenwood 2002 integrated amp. In England, it was actually called Trio, but it's the same thing. And a turntable. Garrett SP25 which I had an Audio-Technica moving magnet cartridge on. And that, seemed, that it was a golden age for recorded music. <coughs> Every week, a new album would be released, which meant we had to play it on our systems. It was uh, Jimi Hendrix, Electric Ladyland, Beatles White Album, Jefferson Airplane after bathing at Baxter's, Cream, Wheels of Fire, the first new Young album. They just keep coming week after week after week. And we would go and we would play the, we would all play them on our systems and it was like, oh, the better the system, the more there is that we can get from the grooves. But I was also at university, I was also playing in a band, that's me again on the far right, and we were doing more and more gigs. We, we were playing, we started off as a soul band, then we got rid of the sax player and trumpet player and became a progressive rock band, because that's what you did. And we, the three of us, also were audiophiles. The guy on the left, the guitarist, Ken Pettit, who sadly passed away recently, he would, after we do a gig, we'd go back to his place and we would listen to music. He'd say, okay, you know, we got this gig, we get back by midnight, we got, I got the new Led, first Led Zeppelin album we could play, or I've got the new Moody Blues Question of Balance we're going to play. So performing live music, but also listening to recorded music was just an integral part of our life. I kept on playing, this, by then, this is 70, I joined this covers band, and we were gigging pretty much three or four, five nights a week. I was finished university, I was working in a science research lab, but I was also playing most evenings to earn money to buy my first apartment. And again, it was the playing of music, connecting to the passion of the music. So, 
72, I changed my system. I replaced the Trio integrated with a Sony integrated because it came with a Sony tuner. Um, cassettes were coming out. I bought a secondhand Wharfdale deck to play cassettes. I bought a pair of headphones. Now, then as now, headphones was the easiest way to get the highest quality sound, the cheapest way. These were Cost Pro 4 AAs. I never did understand what the little microphone connector was on that side. I guess it was to hook it onto a microphone stand. I didn't know why. Most important personage, I replaced the Garrard turntable with a Thorin's TD-150 AB with, with a Shaw M75 EJ cartridge because this was years before Ivor Tiefenbrunn Lynn of Lynn promulgated this idea. I, I felt if the front end is no good, nothing the amplifier or the speakers can do to put back what has gone wrong, what has gone missing. So worked it out for myself. And the three of us in the band, we bought the Thorin's turntable. And belt drive, spring suspension, yes, that was a big, big change in my system. So I was working in a government lab at that time. Long hair was mandatory, of course. That's my, my ID for the lab. Um, I would started off working on electronics in a, in, in a lab. We were doing work, research on LEDs. And I, was, I played a very small part in the development of green LEDs. I still get a twinge of nostalgia when I see one. I'm probably the only audiophile reviewer who's ever made his own transistors. I used to take a slice of um, purified gallium phosphide. Then I would mount a little thing of a little thing of in mount a little indium metal blob on it, and that would make a transistor. And I would use that to characterize the behavior of the gallium phosphide, which was then cut up to make LEDs. By this time, the lab had changed, and I was working in mining chemistry. I'm also the only hi-fi reviewer who's probably worked down a mine, and also done has also panned for gold unsuccessfully, which is why I'm still a hi-fi reviewer. Um, so. There I was in a government lab, but music was still my passion. I was still gigging most nights. And then I left the lab, did a lot of freelance work. That's me playing with folk rocker Carol Ann Pegg. And um, the drummer is still the guy who was in the progressive rock band, still connected on hi-fi. And then he and I got together with this singer-songwriter, uh, Matthew Ellis. He'd had two albums out on Regal Zonophone. He just signed a deal with Warners, and Warners wanted him to do live, live rock. So we signed to Warners, and we made an album. 1972, there we are, um, recording at Abbey Road. This is Studio 3, the small one. We also did some sessions in Studio 2, which is where the Beatles recorded. Um, and you'll see the tape op on the right there is a very young, um, oh god, brain fade. What's his name? Anyway, it'll come to me. Alan Parkins, yeah, thank you. Got a brain fade here. So we made the album. We got a tour book to America. We were doing BBC performances. We did the John Peel show live twice. We would, you know, the future was going to be golden. And then the manager, who's on the, the far right there, did a runner with the advance. Abbey Road never got paid for the album. Warner's cancelled the American tour. And I went from being employed in the government lab to being unemployed in just four months. So I, I took whatever gig I could get. I played with a country and western band. I, you know, I did anything that was, I could earn money. And then the three of us who had failed with the Matthew Ellis band, we got a gig backing Helen Shapiro. Teen sing, teenage singing sensation. And um, I don't know if you ever saw the recent movie on the craze, but they played some of her music on that. We gigged with her for three years, doing basically up to 200 gigs a year. And it was a great experience. Not much time for listening to music at home, but performing live music, being able to judge an audience, being able to see what an audience wanted, great education. And then we were signed to DJM, Elton John's label. And we recorded an album, and it came out in 1975, and it got great reviews, and it didn't sell anything. So, at that time, I, we got, the three of us were doing a lot of recording work. 
It's where I learned how, what happens in a studio, how to use a mixer, all that kind of stuff. But we weren't getting paid. And I remember working, one producer we worked for, he owed me money for doing an album for, for one artist. And he said, look, I can't afford to pay for that album. So look, I have, I've got another project coming up next month. Come and do that for me, and then I'll pay you for both. And then, of course, now he owes me for two albums worth of recordings. I hadn't, didn't, I hadn't got paid to this day. <laughs> so my wife at that time, she said, you know, you need to do something about getting paid. She said, she, re she read the Guardian magazine, the Guardian newspaper, and she said, you know, you read Hi-Fi News, right? And I said, yes, Hi-Fi News record review magazine. I used to read it on the, on the band bus, you know, because it was thick, it lasted a long time. There was a lot of reading in it. She said, well, they're advertising for an editorial assistant. So I joined Hi-Fi News as an editorial assistant. Um, I, I never forget, I, I called the number in the, in the, adver in the advert and John Crabb, the editor himself, answered. I had been reading John Crabb for like eight years at that time. And this was 1976. And he asked me in for an interview. I went in, um, did the interview, and they gave me a, a writing test. Write three pieces, one news item, two record reviews. So I thought, OK. So I, one of, I remember one of the record reviews was of Pacini's Il Tritico, which I didn't know at all, but I did know La Boheme. I did know Pacini, so I sort of winged it. And I got the gig. Years later, I was told they actually, there was somebody else they preferred that the man couldn't spell, and I could. So that got me my gig on Hi-Fi News. And, and it, it was like, I, love, I was 28 years old. This is what I was poor enough to do. It's audio. Audio is science, it's music, and a magazine is both education, education entertainment, they all come together. All three sides of my personality were realized when I joined Hi-Fi News magazine. I appeared on a couple of the covers. I played viola de gamba in a Baroque uh, early music consort at that time. So I did, a, did an article on, on, on making of musical instruments. I still played bass, so I appeared on a cover later. Um, I was, I said, editorial assistant, 1976 when I joined to 78 when I became deputy editor. 82, I, October 82, I became the editor, and this was my chance to make a magazine which I wanted it to reflect what I had learned all that time and communicate to people about it. The system at that time, up to that point, I was still using the Super Lintons, the um, Sony Amp. Then my first wife and I split up, she went off with the system, but now I was at Hi-Fi News, I could borrow stuff. So I borrowed a pair of Gale speakers, Gale SGS-401s, which was, this was a speaker that which was, was a order of magnitude better than the old Super Lintons. And um, I met Ira Gale at that time, crazy, crazy man. I bought a Quad 303 to power them because growing up in England in the 60s, we venerated Quad. Peter Walker was a god, but it sounded awful. So I sold it and I bought a Lexan combination, AP1X power amps, AC1 control unit, designed by Bob Stewart, uh, who later was to become Meridian. Um, replaced the Gales, which were on loan, with a pair of Rogers LS35As, which I bought. Um, but I still have that pair. I still measure them regularly. Every time I measure speakers for the magazine, I first re-measure the Rogers to make sure I'm not doing anything wrong in the measurements. And the LS3 face gave me stereo. The way that the space between your loudspeakers just disappears and you get a picture, two-dimensional picture, into the original recording venue. These the LS3 face did it better than anything I'd ever heard up to that point. Um, they don't go loud, they don't go deep, but to, for, to transport you into the magic of the recording, they were the best thing I'd ever heard at that time. I did a little bit of experiment with quadraphonic sound and gave up because it was never worked well enough. And the two-channel enveloped me enough. Most important, I bought myself a Lin Sonde. Um, I'd already told you that I figured out in 1972 that I needed a better turntable, that I needed to get the source better. I met Ivor Tiefenbrunn 
at a hi-fi show in 1976, the first one I went to for Hi-Fi News. And I walked into his room and said, hello, Mr. Tiefenbrunn, I'm John Atkinson, and I've just joined Hi-Fi News. Get out of my room, he shouted at me, <laughs> because the October 76 issue of Hi-Fi News had a review of the Lynn, where he can the reviewer, Frank Jones, compared it negatively with the Ariston RD-11 and the Fon CQ-30. And of course, Lynn, as a contractor, was actually making bits for those other two turntables, so he was not at all happy with me. So I ended up, I, coincidentally, I was driving down to Salisbury to visit Julian Vereker of name, and he said, I'll sell you a Lin. So, okay, I bought a Lin, and it was a big step upwards. I used it with a bunch of cartridges, um, a Dy Dynavector diamond I liked very much till I broke it, uh, an entree moving coil, um, the Shure V15 four I tried, one with a little brush on the end, didn't like that at all. I decided that there's something about moving coil cartridges that I liked. Made a big step backwards. I took part in some blind listening tests organized by Martin Collins. And there were, of the amplifiers we were listening, one of them was a, what the heck was it? It was a Michael and Austin TVA1. The other was a Quad 405. There was a third one, I can't remember. But we did, all, we did two days of blind listening tests, the result of which was we couldn't tell the difference at all that didn't really matter. You might as well buy the amplifier, which looks nice, or as I said, you know, with Quad, legendary brand, why not? So I bought the Quad, and I stopped listening to music. I mean, the sound was the same, apparently, but there was something missing. It wasn't, I wasn't being drawn in. So I thought, well, maybe there was something wrong with the blind listening test. You know, maybe the test itself had obscured the differences. So I borrowed a Michelson Austin TVA-10. Uh, it's a 50 watt per channel, uses push-pull pairs of EL-34s. And the magic came back, so I bought it. And, oh, well, that's really strange. Amplifying on pretty much, I couldn't tell the difference under blind listening tests, but when I bought it and used it, I'm listening to music again. This time also, I borrowed a pair of quad electrostatics. They did the same that the Rogers LS35As did, but more. They were most wonderful sound. So I couldn't keep them. My, my, my ex-wife took them. But nevertheless, it was, it was, I really, that, was, that was a big step forward in my system. The Lin turntable, the tube amp, the quad electrostatics. Um, preamps. I never really got on with the quad preamps. And as I said, I'd, I'd like the Lexon except I'd sold it when I realized that amps all sounded the same. And then I met Bob Stewart when he was at Meridian and thought, well, why don't I try one of the Meridian preamps? This is the 101. It's the first preamp that used the um, Signetics NA5534 op amp chip. Um, still around, people still use it, has very low static distortion. And this preamp really brought my system that little bit further towards involvement, towards stereo, imaging, drawing me into the music. And while I had it, it's, got a, it's a little case. It has a tiny little toroid in. And I was doing a lot of DIY stuff at that time. I made preamps, I made a microphone mixer, made some test equipment. And I thought, well, maybe, what if I put a bigger transformer on it? So I bought an empty chassis from Meridian, because I wanted it to look nice, put the biggest toroidal transformer I could find with the same voltage rating, and powered this preamp from the separate supply. Oh my goodness. The sound opened up more. How could that be? The op-amp chips don't draw any current. So how does having a bigger toroid make a difference? So something to think about. I um, got remarried and was given as a wedding present a pair of Celestian SO6s, two-way. Um, first, we could have a metal dome tweeter that I'd ever used. It was copper, so sensitivity was awful. But there was something very nice about that speaker. So I lived with that system for about three years. Then I became aware in 84 there was something happening in the United States. I'd seen first issues of a magazine called The Absolute Sound, another magazine called Stereophile, and they were writing about equipment I'd never heard of, but I'd seen at the Consumer Electronics Show. I did a review of the Krell KSA 50 amplifier in August 1983, one of the first reviews I'd ever written. And this amplifier did bass I'd never heard before, even with the little Celestian two ways. It was like, pow, pow. And I'm a bass player. I like that. I like my bass guitar to have force, to have impact. 
and that amplifier did it better than anything I've heard. I then was reviewed the Audio Research SP10, and the space became bigger. Why? I don't know. I love the SP10. I still have it. It uses 6922 tubes, burns through them like crazy. But every now and again, I get it out just to remind myself of what so excited me back then. I exchanged the SL6s for SL600s, this similar drive unit array, same woofer, but now an aluminum dome tweeter, um, an Aerolam aluminum honeycomb sandwich, very light. The idea being that there would be no energy storage in the cabinet. And then it all went crazy. My wife left me, and I'm sitting there thinking, what the heck do I do? And I got a phone call. It was Larry Archibald, the publisher of Sterifar. This was November 85. He said, I saw what you've done with Hi-Fi News. And I, what I'd done with Hi-Fi News, I became the editor in October 82. And by November 85, when Larry had called me, I doubled its circulation. I put in, I made it the magazine I wanted to read, which I, so Larry said, would you be interested in coming to the United States and do for Stereophile what you did for Hi-Fi News? So I said, I I'll let me think about it, Larry. Put the phone down, started to pack, because <laughs> this was my escape route from a failed marriage, and I'd hit a ceiling with Hi-Fi News. Hi-Fi News had been bought by a big conglomerate. They were published by a small company called Link House. So that was bought by a big conglomerate called United Newspapers, and I was getting a lot of interference from senior managers who felt that they knew better than I did what would make Hi-Fi News successful. This is not a problem that ever went away, but, but at least <laughs> when I went to, so I went to Stereophile, joined in, in May the 1st, 1986, and I became, I joined the legendary Jay Gordon Holt, that was us on the cover of Audiophile Voice magazine soon after I joined. Gordon was a mentor and one of the writers who defined how to write about sound quality. He really was a, a, a pioneer in that regard. He came before Harry Pearson of the Absolute Sound. Um, it was an awkward relationship because Gordon had sold the magazine to Larry Archibald in 82, had stayed on as editor, but Gordon was never the most productive of writers or editors. And that's why Larry wanted me to come and join Stereophile. So now here am I, only being a magazine editor four years, and I'm Gordon's boss. So awkward relationship. We managed it for actually right, from, right, right up to 13 years. But great man, but difficult working relationship. Yeah, there's a quick cartoon of my story of joining Stereophile met Larry and Gordon at one of the infamous Stereophile CES parties, drove back from Las Vegas with Larry in um, January 86 to plan everything, and then came over May, May 86. We planned on that journey, that long road drive, we planned everything that was, we were going to do with Stereophile for the next 10 years. And it all pretty much happened to, to that timetable, with the exception from going a digest magazine to a full-size magazine, we ended up doing it in January 94. We'd originally planned we'd do it in January 93, but um, that was really the only slippage. Yeah, that was a, the two of us, Gordon and myself, this was a listening test in 1988. We, we did a lot of those together. You know, so I'm wearing cowboy boots. I'm acclimatizing to New Mexico, which is where Sterophile was based. Gordon is wearing tennies and t-shirt because that's what he wore all the time. Back to my system. I took the 600s with me, took the Corel with me, took the, the Audio Research SP10. That was my system in the, in the late 1980s. Then I discovered Mark Levinson Digital. There was something about what Mark, the Mark Levinson company was doing that I really loved. So I bought a number 30 processor after we reviewed it. I bought a 31.5 CD transport after we reviewed it. That was the best digital I'd heard at that time. For speakers, I'd still had the LS35As, went for a succession of speakers, and I ended up, I reviewed the Bowers and Wilkins Silver Signature Edition in 1984, and they did everything the LS35As did, 
that they had more bass. And in my room that I had at Santa Fe, they sounded spectacular. Um, Robert Truns, who owned Bowles and Wilkins at that time, was visiting. Uh, he was an old friend of my wife's. And he said, you know, I never heard them sound this good back at Bowles and Wilkins. And I was using, I'd bought a pair of Mark Levinson 33H power amps to drive for Bowles and Wilkins. And that was a great system. I mean, you know, we all know from listening tests that amplifiers don't make a difference. But the muscle that those those, those Mark Levinson amps had, and the, uh, enough bass and enough loudness from the Bowers and Wilkins, it was quite wonderful. So moving forward, to this century, I'm still playing the bass. I don't do many gigs now, maybe one a year, but um, I still have that passion for live music. KSA, can you still see, see some action? There it is over there in the corner. John the loudspeaker. Manu manufacturer John DeVore has music evenings every now and again. In this one, he decided to show the movie for Forbidden, Forbidden Planet. And that's, of course, where Dan D'Agostino got the idea, the name Krell from. So John asked me to bring it over, and we had a good old time. I think that's you, Stephen, right? Sitting there. <laughs> and as I said, I've been editing Stereophile now for 32 years. And I do all the measurements. And I, it's, I love doing the measurements. It's like a detective story. When I did my, took my bachelor's finals in 72, one of them was you had an afternoon, they gave you a box with two electrical terminals on it, and you had to say what it was. If I remember correctly, the one I had, it was a Zena diode in series with a resistor. But you had to characterize what that box was in three hours. That was your, one of your final exams. And measuring audio equipment is the same thing. It's a box with electrical terminals. What does it do? What is the designer for important about what it should do? What has he missed? What has he overlooked? What's peculiar about it? And I measure five, six, or seven products a month, been doing so since, oh gosh, 1989. And it's still fascinating for me to get something out of the box, set it up, what does it do? And it's, it's it's, it's a passion. I still have the music passion. It's, this is an audio engineering passion. And my system these days, I bought a pair of Kef LS50 speakers. I still have the Bowers and Wilkins, but they don't work in my room in Brooklyn as well, nearly as well as they did in my room in Santa Fe. These little speakers do everything I want in terms of imaging, mid-range accuracy, stereo imaging, it's just they don't go loud, they don't do bass. But as you know from my previous systems, this is not a high priority for me to have thunderous room-shaking towers. Um, I bought the Air SACD player back in 2005 after we reviewed it. Still use it as a CD transport. Don't play SADs, SACDs much anymore. Digital front end has been um, PS Audio Direct Stream DAC with a network, network bridge adapter, which I use with Rune. Um, after I reviewed the Rune Nucleus server, I bought that because it, the combination of Rune and a network-enabled DAC, it's almost as good as having physical products that you hold in your hand, as was described in John Darko's talk before this one. The fact you can see the album covers, you, get the, you can get reviews, you see the notes, you get the credits, you see all the musicians. It's not like holding an LP cover, but it's, it, it's almost as good. And you have the flexibility of just being able to sit there in your listening chair, never having to get up and put a CD on or an LP on. Um, I'm in the process of slowly ripping all my LPs to digital using the Air QA9 at 24192, which is the best A to D converter I've ever used. And that's the system. That, that's what I'm now using. And one thing you notice, there's no amplifier. I'm still looking for that perfect amp. The Mark Levinson's got very close to it, and then one broke. And Mark Levinson doesn't service their reference products anymore, which I thought, what? Isn't that the point of high-end audio, like Macintosh? You have a Macintosh receiver from 1968. They, they will still fix it. But Mark, the Mark Levinson brand, which has been through corporate changes, no longer, no longer supports legacy products like my amplifiers. Well, so I'm still looking. Um, 
There you go. I mean, I said about, I said earlier about, this reminds me of what I said earlier about corporate ninnies. When one of the reasons I was, you know, susceptible to being tempted to cross the Atlantic when Larry Archibald called me in November 85, Larry and I owned Stereophile from when, when I joined. I, my price for joining Crossing the Atlantic was I must be allowed to buy into the company to become a partner, not just an employee. So Larry and I owned Stereophile 86 through 98 when we cashed out. We sold to Peterson Publishing. They in turn sold to EMAP USA in 99. They in turn sold to Prime Media in 2003. Prime Media sold to Source Interlink in 2007. Source Interlink was a publicly held company. They went bankrupt, came out of bankruptcy as a closely held private company in 2009. They sold us to um, Golden Tree Capital Company in 2014. And then this March, we were sold to AV Tech in the UK. So I've been for a succession of corporate managers. And keeping Sterefile true to that fundamental belief of mine that a magazine has to inform, educate, and entertain, something I seized on in 1982 when I became the editor of Hi-Fi News, has not been easy with a, after Larry and I sold. Because there are always corporate managers who say, well, you know, we, you know you're too esoteric. Your writing is too, too high at grade school level. No one wants graphs and charts. And I would patiently explain that my model for a magazine was based on the hi-fi news of the late 60s, edited by John Crabb, where the two went together. The, ex the description of the sound, the description of the measurements, they have to be there. I've kept true to that ever since I became an editor. But it's difficult because corporate managers don't understand that. They just look at numbers and, and say, well, you know, and then I say, that's my trump card. I say, okay, you want me to change? Look at the numbers, look at Stereophile's financials, and you'll see that we don't need to change. And then they get very uncomfortable because, and then sometimes I've, I've been, sometimes I've had to, I wish there was that English equivalent to the Japanese word, hi. Hi, in Japan, everyone translates it, yes. It doesn't mean yes. It means I acknowledge that I've heard what, you, what you've said. <laughs> and then I wait for the manager who's asked me to do something I don't want to. I wait for him to be fired or to be promoted out of the way. And then the cycle starts again with a new manager. This, with the new acquisition by AV Tech, it's been easier in the sense that they publish Hi-Fi News, they publish Hi-Fi Choice. My boss is Paul Miller who's editor of Hi-Fi News and who worked, once worked for me, so he knows what I do and why. So, fingers crossed it works out under the new ownership. But, um, yeah, I, mean, I must tell you a story. So, this was December 2009, and we had a new manager at that time who came in and he got this brilliant idea, which is you're publishing all this content, but it's free to the manufacturers who you're writing about. He said, why don't you start a new thing where you charge the manufacturers for writing about them? And I said, hi. <laughs> so, and I, I went away from that meeting thinking, what the heck do I do? So, two weeks later, I was giving a presentation at the Los Angeles and Orange County Audiophile Society Gala. And this manager was based in Southern California, San Juan Capistrano. I said, look, you live only 10 miles away from the gala. Come and see me. Come and see me give my presentation in my environment, with my peeps, with my audience. Come and see me and you'll understand why I, ha I do what I do, not what you want me to do. And he said, okay. So, morning of the gala, I get a phone call from this guy, from the manager. He says, I'm really sorry, I can't make it. I've got a meeting in Los Angeles I have to go to instead. Heart sunk. How do I get this guy off my back? Anyway, Duke Gala went very well, gave me a presentation. And I'm sitting at Santa Ana Airport on Monday morning. And I get a phone call. Did you hear? Al Crowley has got fired. I thought, oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you, God. <laughs> uh, of course, I said his name out loud. Forget you said that. <laughs> I said that. But no, I mean, sometimes under, in great corporate structures, managers want you to do things which run counter to the spirit of what you want to do. And 
You just have to resist that, tempt that pressure. And I've res been resisting it since Larry and I sold the magazine in 98. And now I'm hoping that under the new ownership, there won't be those crazy pressures. Probably given away way too much. But the point is, I read Hi-Fi News in the late 60s. It was the magazine I wanted to read. When I became its editor in 82, I could make it the magazine that I wanted to read based on what it was in the 60s when I first got my first system. And Sterifal, I could do that with Larry because Larry gave me total freedom to do what I wanted, to make a magazine. And that's what I've done ever since, without selling out, with resisting pressures. It's, it's a long, rocky road, but as you can see, a lot of fun, a lot of system changes, and the music still excites me. Anyway, thank you. So, questions. I got, we got time for, some, for a few cute questions. Thank you. Okay, a question here. If you can use the microphone, please, so it's recorded. Uh, the, the corporate managers, what is the percentage that's trainable, would you say? I would say zero, because if you, have an M if you have a Harvard MBA and you come in, you think you know everything. But what you don't know is the spirit, the something that makes a specialty magazine like Stereophile special and why it survives and why it continues to make money. I won't say that, you know, I have all the answers, but all through my career, I've made sure the numbers back me up. So not through selling out, not through doing anything, but basically if I do a good enough magazine, it'll be successful enough that even if a manager is really unhappy with what I'm doing, he'll look at the finances and go, mm, well, maybe I'll let it go another year, by which time he's, he's moved on. It's, it's difficult. Um, I, that's a thought, fleeting thought crossed my mind then about, yeah, what makes a specialty magazine special? It is you define a niche that's narrow and deep, that there's a lot of information in a very narrow area, and then you give us the education, the information that your readers deserve. It so happens that that model is what enables a magazine to survive in the internet age. Narrow and deep is difficult to find on the, on the web very easily. Wide and shallow is everywhere. Narrow and deep is not. So Sterifar, when we launched our website in 90, December 97, turned out we had a formula for survival and success in the internet age. We were narrow and deep, which means the brand survives, the brand thrives even though everyone says, well, paper magazines are dying. I mean, they're not. Lots are, don't get me wrong. But successful paper magazines, if they can integrate with the web, have a, a good future ahead of them. Another question. No questions at all? I mean, not about any of our individual reviews about <laughs> things we've heard? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you've measured, what, hundreds of amplifiers? Uh, yeah, I've measured, I think it's about 830 loudspeakers up to now, and about 300 amplifiers. So are, is it still a mystery, or are you getting a clue about what correlates with good sound? <laughs> <laughs> ah, good sound or accurate sound. I mean, if you look at the review, some of the reviews we published, if you want to make an amplifier, which people will, will say, well, that sounds really nice, give it a hefty dose of second harmonic distortion. You can see it. I mean, it has a bent transfer function, but the second harmonic distortion, if it's not accompanied by a lot of intermodulation, makes everything fatter and warmer and nice. And I mean, we have a review of a carry amplifier in, in our um, December issue, which has 3% second harmonic distortion at like five watts. And our reviewer said, you know, this sounds just like a single-ended trio amp. Well, of course it does. It has the same bent transfer function. The audio research amplifier we reviewed in October has the same sonic signature, but the distortion is like 10 times or more lower. But I listened to that amplifier and I know what it's doing, and yet, my goodness, I enjoyed the sound. <laughs> So when you say one sounds good or sounds accurate, they're two different things. Um, the, the benchmark AHB2 amplifier that we reviewed in uh, November 
2015 and just been rewritten about by Jim Austin in our, in our October issue. That is an astonishing amplifier. It, it, its basic performance is better than my audio precision analyzer. And when I measured it, audio precision, guided audio precision was actually on the phone helping me sort of with some hacking to get the, the precision audio precision analyzer to be able to measure what the benchmark amp is doing. However, it doesn't sound as nice as the audio research. And is that because it's better or because it's doing something wrong that we were unable to find? And if we are unable to find it, why does it matter? You know, it's, it's, the whole thing is, is just, it's tricky. And of course, the blind listening test, say they all sound the same anyway. So I don't know, it's, um, yeah. Loudspeakers, what do they, what do I know what they do? Yeah, it, I mean, if you look at the, the KEF, it has beautifully cons controlled dispersion. The sound it puts out to the side is rolls off in a beautifully controlled manner, no hot spots at any frequency range. Um, flat, flat response within, within, regular, within good limits. Um, no resonances in the cone. A lot of speakers I measure use keep seeing, the Ollis, Rogers Ellis 3 5 was a typical example of this. You see its frequency response, and then around about between one and three K, have a little blip like that. And what that is, is basically where the sound is going out through the cone, hits the surround, reflects back, and you get a little resonance, anti-resonance thing going on. And you see that a lot still in loudspeakers. I don't know why speaker manufacturers don't, aren't more bothered by that. Maybe it's not that important. You get a little bit of nasal coloration, but you, you tend to be quite, you tend to get adjust to colorations. Very, it's like looking through glasses with a tint. After a while, you don't notice there's a tint. Um, digital, it's, this, these are, you'd think, I mean, uh, you know, 30, 40 years, 40 years after the first A to D converters were introduced by the BBC in England and Denon in Japan, you'd think that all the problems have been solved. Um, but they're not. They're, they're, I mean, there's a debate going on now. I mean, you know, what's the best sample rate? What's the bit, the bit depth? Well, you know, CD is 16. Turns out some, some CDs can sound very good. But if you do it 24, or now, you know, Pro Tools operates with 32 bit depth. You have more, more. You have more things, more things, more dynamic range to play with, more things to do without screwing up the sound. As a delivery medium, 16 is pretty good. 20 would be nice. Um, there aren't any consumer DACs which give you resolution better than 21 bits. Most do 19 or 20 bits. Sample rate. I hear differences going from 44.1 to 96. I hear differences going from 96 to 192. 384, well, you're, you're, you're creating huge amounts of data, probably without any significant effect on sound quality. DSD worried me at the lower rates at DSD64, which is what SACD used. You're introducing huge amounts of ultrasonic noise. And even if you can't hear the noise, I'm not sure that's a good thing. Certainly, some amplifiers would blow up if you could hit it with higher levels of ultrasonic noise. Um, it may be, I was, you know, people say about DSD, well, it sounds so sweet. Well, maybe it's something to do with the fact that there's all that ultrasonic noise there, differing their ears or something. It, I, I don't know. Um, then you have recently, in the last four years, the whole topic of MQA, the Codec encoding system that Bob Stewart, Peter Craven developed. Now I have, as you say, I've had a relationship with Bob Stewart going all the way back to set seven, well, yes, yeah, seventy-seven when I bought the Lexon preamp power amp. I was already aware of him at that time because he did an article in a nineteen seventy-two article of an issue of Wireless World magazine where he wrote about tape recorder circuit design. So I knew his name. I got to know him. And then I also knew Peter Craven back in the late 70s. He was, and this Peter Craven is an engineer's engineer. He worked with the late Michael Gerzon, 
another engineer, engineer. I met these people when I was, you know, working at Hi-Fi News before I became editor, and I, they had both had a huge effect on me. I remember, my, and then Michael Gers and I stayed in touch with, I remember talking to him at the 93 AES convention in San Francisco about this scheme he was doing for burying information in the analog noise on a recording, where if you, if you look at noise on a recording, if that's frequency this way, amplitude that way, it's, if you've got a slope, it's a, it's a sort of sloping spectrum, highest in the bass, lowest at the treble. He said, well, this area here, what if you replaced it with pseudo-random noise, same spectrum, same amplitude, every frequency, but you encoded information in that. Now, this isn't a new idea. This is something that Alan Turing did, actually did, in the 40s for secure communication between Churchill and Roosevelt, where they would send by radio what sounded like noise. But at the other end, you could extract from that noise by using a, a subtractive, uh, using a pseudo-random signal you sent in advance by a side channel. Then by, when you convolved the pseudo-random with the received noise with the pseudo-random noise, audio appeared. It was only 8-bit, but it was done in, what, 1944. So Michael Gerson was looking at this and thinking, well, what if we used this information space on all recordings that all have noise like that, we could use it to bury higher resolution. This was, and then he ended up working with Peter Craven. It was a scheme, I think it was called Extra Bits. Nothing ever came of it. Then he very sadly died. He, like me, was an asthmatic, but unlike me, he went out, with his, out without his emergency inhaler and he died. So when I first came across MQA, and uh, Bob Stewart and Peter Craven gave a paper at the October 2014, AES convention in Los Angeles, it was, ah, okay, so you're, you're going to, you're proposing a more efficient transmission of data, and so that saves bandwidth. Four, even four years ago, that was more of an issue than it is now. Um, you're encoding what only needs to be encoded. That sounds elegant to me. That's, you know, if you look at coding theory, you don't want to transmit more information than you need to. I mean, in the absolute minimum, Let's say you, Stephen, want to play Daft Punk's album. If you have it, I can send you an email message saying, play Daft Punk. Absolute minimum of information communicated, maximum reproduction of, 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 of quality, because you already have it. So the opposite side, with, say, a 24-bit, 384 kilohertz PCM type file, you have, like, four gigabytes of information, not all of which is going to be useful. So transmitting all of it is, is not elegant, it's brute force. So MQA Kodak, I got fascinated with it. We've written a lot about it in the magazine, looking at the various aspects of it. Um, yeah, so yeah, digital is still under development. How long do you think MQA will be around? Depends. I mean, it, it's been picked up by Tidal, but Tidal is one of the smallest you know, streaming. I mean, they're very midget compared to Spotify. Spotify broadcasts MP3 only. And as far as the general public concerned, they're not reacting positively to higher resolution in general, let alone something like MQA. I mean, the big thing now is Bluetooth speakers. Everything is Bluetooth, Bluetooth headphones. I hate the idea of Bluetooth because you're taking, let's say you listen to an MP3 file on your Bluetooth enabled headphones. You're taking something which has been lossy, lossy encoded, the MP3s, throwing away real information that you can hear. And if I would play you original an MP3 file, uh, you'd never listen to MP3s, MP3s again because you can hear what's been left out. You're then passing that M lossy compressed MP3 file through another lossy codec into the Bluetooth, so it can be transmitted by Bluetooth. And when you do that, when you cascade lossy codec, codecs, it sounds, it's, you're throwing away real music. You're ending something which is like a cartoon of music. Why would you want that? Well, it turns out that convenience, as always, trumps quality, that people will go for Bluetooth, 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 even if the music is destroyed. So MQA is offering the general public higher quality and the general public will probably react and say, no, thank you. I mean, MQA does offer something. I, I examined in an article in the September issue, which was also based on something I'd done years ago, which is the time domain behavior of A to D, a time, to, time domain behavior of A to D converters. 
The, I mentioned earlier, I'm digitizing my LP, LPs slowly um, with the Air QA9 converter at 24192. This is a unique converter. It doesn't mess up the time domain. It gives you perfect time domain performance with a 24192 capture. MQA is claiming to do the same. And if you have an end-to-end -end MQA chain, you get in digital a perfect time domain representation of the original analog signal, the trade-off being that there might be what's called alias imaging reflected back into the audio band. Might be. It's going to depend very much on the music. So MQA is offering you a potential benefit, which is improved time, perfect time domain performance from a digital system, which you couldn't ac ever actually otherwise have, unless you had an Air QA9 and an experimental air converter that the late Charlie Hansen developed, which gave you the perfect complement to the Air QA9. You can't get that. MQA is offering you that. But it's an improvement in sound quality, I'm convinced. I'm not sure if that's a big enough commercial factor to outweigh the general public's lack of interest in quality and then the socio-political aspects of MQA, such as digital rights management. So I don't think I answered your question. I don't know if, if, it, if it doesn't get picked up soon by Apple or something, then it'll be an interesting historic. Yeah, general public doesn't climb on board, then it's Yeah, general public never climbed aboard DVD audio. It's yeah. dead. Okay. They, they never climbed aboard SACD. I mean, SACD CD still survives as a niche, high-quality classical music medium, but it's tiny. Sir, go oh, give yeah. microphone, please. Just so people kind of know in the room, the whole thing with high res is it just is not selling to the person who wants just a slight upgrade. I'd like better sound. Well, and, and I have, like in my office, I have a nice system in there. And people say, oh, yeah, that sounds nice, but I don't need that much. What? Yeah. 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 I mean, this, is, this is clients just coming in and out yeah. of my business. High res in itself is not a guarantee of good sound because there's so many things that the recording engineers and the mixing engineers and the mastering engineers, engineers can mess up. So if you get a high res version of a, a squashed dynamic range piece of garbage, <laughs> you know, I mean, this is one of the things. What, I don't know if you were at this show in 2009. I gave a presentation in a room down the corridor playing examples of damaged music, victim of the dynamic range wars. And I thought, well, at least some people are making an issue of this. If anything, it's even worse now. That music with all the dynamics squashed out of it. I mean, I, I find it amazing right now that if you want... Some examples of uncompressed music with real dynamic range are EDM, you know, DJ music. What's that about? You know, when you get something like, you know, the, um, you know Adele's 21. She's a real talent, but her album is squashed within an inch of its life. Why? Because the only people who are going to buy Adele's 21 are middle-aged people who still appreciate good dynamic range, you would think. You know, so, <laughs> yeah, so nine years later, the that battle is still being fought. Fought. A microphone at the back. Uh, John, what do you think of uh, Harmon's uh, attempts and Dr. Floyd Toole's attempts to objectify uh, loudspeaker measurements? Well, I visited. and all I, that. I, I visited Sean Olive, who's um, Floyd's yeah. assistant and now runs the research facility at Northridge. Visited him twice. Um, first time, the speaker shuffling thing they have, where you they moves the speakers into the same place, wasn't working. The second time I went. And we discussed it at length. And one of the things that bothered me was they listen in mono. Now, you could say, as Sean does and Floyd does, that it doesn't matter, that the speaker is still behaving the same. Therefore, listening in mono is a lot more efficient, doing your listening test in mono. That bothers me because it's a step away from how we all listen. And um, uh, the late Richard Heiser mentioned this. He said, you get something called stereo unmasking. Well, let's say you have a bit of distortion at this place in the sound stage. If you play in mono, it's going to be located in exactly the same place as the image. If you play in stereo, the image of that instrument may be here, but the actual distortion artifact will be here. It's been unmasked because you're listening in stereo. And I think when you reduce listening to mono 
to judge loudspeakers, you're going to miss things like that. You're still going to need flat response. Um, you're still going to pick up a lot of the things which are wrong with a loudspeaker, but you're not listening in the, sa in the same way that the end users are. But then if you listen in the same way the end users are, you now have two speakers. They've got to be in the same place in the room. Um, when we used to, we, we did a lot of blind listening tests of speakers in Sterefile in the early 90s. Um, it's one of the things I, I was interested in exploring. We started off with like six people sitting in front of the loudspeakers. Well, that didn't work because only one person is in the sweet spot and there's a big effect of position, listening position in the room. So we ended up with three people, one behind the other. Then they didn't have to watch, see the speakers, so we hung a scrim in front of the speakers. Well, that changed the room acoustics very badly. It absorbed the highs terribly. So Tom Norton, who was our technical editor at that time, said, okay, we'll get the best, most transparent grill cloth we can, and we'll drop a cylinder around it, around each speaker, so that it won't affect the dispersion of the speaker, it won't affect the acoustics of the room, and, but people won't be able to identify the speakers. That was the best thing we did. But then you still had three people sitting in a line. So we ended up with one person at a time listening to the speakers under blind conditions. It made this extraordinary time consuming. You know, we're a monthly magazine. We have to get a magazine out. But to spend basically 10 days of doing blind listening tests to speakers, one listener at a time, it was very instructive. We got some good results. Um, Stanley Lipschitz, who's one of the blind listening people at the AES at that time, even congratulated on us. But if we kept on doing it, we wouldn't have never got a magazine out on time. So anyway, I'm, I'm digressing on, on blind listening. There's a question at the front, if you could say that. I'm fascinated with all the work that you've done so diligently for so many years with, with testing, and particularly because you're one of the few people um, through, through, across such a wide spectrum of products and technologies have insisted on measuring and at the same time you're not a person that is st stuck in the myopia of everything else is subjective and therefore I'm not going to listen. No, you're doing both, which is fantastic. And as a designer, it's how I was taught from a pup. You know, you, you, know, you measure everything. You learn everything that you can technically and then you listen as well. Your, your best, most objective, not subjective tool you have are your ears and it's ultimately what every one of your clients are going to use but you use both because otherwise you can miss obvious things and chase your tail indefinitely. Yeah. But that being said, be, you know, I'm known for certain types of things because that's what I've been given an opportunity to do, but I've been an analog engineer from the time I was a teenager, uh, long before I went to school. That's where I got my start. So the thing that, that interests me, whether it's um, digital testing equipment or my old analog gear that I'm working on or a combination of both, is the thing, and I'm curious about how much you've worked with this. Um, I've been working a lot in recent years with uh, digital difference files, simply because for a lot of technologies, there's just going to be no other right, objective way right. to deal with it. And then the second thing is, is that because I specialize in dealing with noise, whether it's noise that's induced or inherent, that has to do with dealing with things that are incredibly low in level, yet are going to be very important because yeah. through, sp through spectrum analysis, it's going to be very clear that so much of what we prize as audiophiles, the, um, the harmonic series, the extreme highs, um, uh, your imaging cues, all of that tends to be information that's very, very low in level, often very high in frequency response, and all that information mostly tends to be very low in, in listening level, but so little conventional uh, measurements do anything about that. Um, Everybody, or it's well to these engineers, you know, to win the contest at zero dBU, but to be able to have something that does well at zero dBU and simultaneously does well at negative 85 or negative 120. Or if you're going to do dynamic intermodulation or transient intermodulation, that was a big step forward in 1977 for John Curl and Matteo Tala. Yeah. What, what about being able to take not two frequencies you know, like I'm working against each other in a pulse transit, you know, like 3,000 hertz and 10,000 hertz, but what about 10,000 hertz and 10 megahertz? Well, I, A, I don't, have the, I don't have the analyzer that will handle megahertz region stuff. I do have a dream. When I retire, what I want to do is characterize an amplifier completely with a three-dimensional plot 
of, dis of every distortion harmonic versus frequency versus level versus power. And you would get a surface for each harmonic showing you how it would change with the music. That is big. That I don't have time to do it while, I, while I'm editing a magazine, but I think for audio frequencies and amplifiers, that would be something which would reveal real information because you would see how the spectrum of the harmonics would change as the music changed in level and frequency. Are we done? Yeah, okay. So that's, I, that's what I do when I retire. Rather than play golf, why play golf? What a waste of, what is it, a waste of a good walk. Who said that? So, so that's one of the things I want to do. But, um, well, we're out of time. Thank you so much for listening.